Autumn is a time of change, and we've all known that since we were kids, but it's so clear in a forest garden when you're surrounded by hundreds of species, each with their own cycle and time. I used to think there was a moment in every year where you could blink and all the leaves would just drop out of the sky. but. There's a long progression before that final ballet of color and movement, where every sort of leaf that began the year fresh and glowing has turned haggard and coarse. And more surprising still is that despite the cooling temperatures, in fact, because of them, there's a sort of second spring taking place. There's a bunch of species that thrived early in the year, but they died back in the summer heat and are now chancing one last little spurt of growth. There's a confusion to it, or a celebration, where every season is present at the same time and they're all vying for control. There's the last throes of summer stored in all variety of fruit and nuts and there's a looming winter in the weeks on end of rain and the few trees who've already lost their leaves. And there's also this coziness of spring growing up everywhere around you. And in the tension between the seasons this year, storms came and changed our skyline. The empress tree at the center of our land, the tallest tree we'd ever planted has split in half. It fills me with all sort of emotion and thoughts that I can only really describe as nature's answer to a debate we've been having for a few years about whether or not to prune her. Choice made. When we planted her, we hadn't really realized how fast she was going to grow, and now, years before we thought it would be a problem, she's been shading out my favorite part of the garden where it's been getting harder and harder to grow certain species or have certain fruit ripen. I knew that on some level that at some point we'd probably have to prune her, but she was so beautiful. I couldn't stomach cutting a branch, but thanks to that choice or lack of a choice, when the winds came, she was a sail that took on the brunt of that force. And she's got quite soft wood. Brittle, in fact, so she cracked. While 20 meters away, her sister, who was just as tall but had been pruned quite heavily just the month before, sailed through without a hitch. I guess the lesson is to let go of perfect. It's never what you expect. And in this particular case, I was holding on to the hope of that beautiful spring flower and the awe people feel when they visit and they can come sit beneath her crown. And I can say that she's 18 meters at last count. And then we can play the game where I ask them how old she is. And they say, hmm, 30? And I tell them, eight. And they sit there for a moment and I can say, yep, fastest growing tree in the world under ideal conditions. Maybe perfection here is something I find a bit ugly. Cutting her down instead of letting those 18 meters of flower. Maybe bringing down those trunks and branches to break them down and let her body feed the soil is actually what's perfect. I don't know. But I know that feeding soil is a good thing. But the nature of it is so destructive. And all I can do is remember what Mufasa taught me that for one living thing to live, another living thing has to die. And you'd expect me being a forest gardener that most of my life is spent planting and you'd be wrong. Planting's the beautiful start, but care for these trees so often takes on cutting things down. You've 
wouldn't believe how much of my life is destruction because in our region we have one of those good problems where things grow too much where we're top five most rainfall in Europe and of those five we get the most light and warmth so there's a lot of species that really like that and just grow all the time a lot and my favorite of those and the subject of the majority of my destruction is the blackberry. Blackberry grows into impenetrable thickets that can get several meters tall in a single year while shading out native plants beneath it and then drying out to become a bit of a fire risk underneath. So it's one of the main plants we cut to build soil. Every fall, for a little while every day, I go out and I destroy a year of the blackberry's work. It's monotonous, but strangely satisfying to see all the organic matter on the ground decomposing, knowing the soil's being fed. And it really is thanks to all that destruction that we're creating habitat for plants from every strata to grow all at once. Once the blackberry's gone, we can have grasses, perennials, bushes, blackberry and trees all growing simultaneously in the same space. Mufasa was right. Look at all the life that comes out of it. These hazels and heart nuts, chestnuts, they've all feasted at some point on compost and broken down leaf litter. These myrtles, pineapple and strawberry guava, chayo, these are all beneficiaries of that destruction. No, I haven't been much in the garden since early summer. Every bed in there was started with a hefty amount of compost, and now the oka, yakon, and sunchok, they're growing with minimal effort on our part. And that's not to mention all the food we didn't get to harvest. The crows cracked and devoured who knows how many walnuts. Hornets got half the plums, and within two weeks of hitting the ground, a half ton of peaches completely disappeared. I can't imagine the flurry of bugs, birds, and bacteria that just feasted. And then there's all the foods that would produce in this part of the year if they were just a bit older. The acorns, pecans, monkey puzzles, pawpaws, and a dozen others, including this Fuyu persimmon, by the way, which is about to ripen for the first time. And I kind of have to tell you about it because Apparently this kind of persimmon has the texture of an apple, like you've got to bite into it and it has a crunch, but I don't really know because I've never actually tried one, but I have read about it in books. And I still remember how excited I was when I first figured out that this fruit can even exist and I could grow it myself. I ordered one as soon as possible and she arrived with her roots overgrown thickened around the holes at the bottom of her pot so I couldn't get her out. I think I spent two hours in surgery with that pot with different kinds of knives and scissors trying to cut back the plastic as carefully as I could not to damage the taproot, which I learned had grown down out of the pot and then back in through the heart of its own cluster of roots, but with my anxiety I couldn't go slow enough and I managed to rip and mangle all sorts of roots in the process. So I've been watching, worried for years, hoping I didn't hurt her too bad. You can imagine it's quite a special moment for me to see those fruit, which will be the gift of the last days of autumn, nature's last little reward before we slip into the cold and sleep of winter. I can't say I'm really looking forward to winter this year. For some reason, I think I'll miss the warmth more than most years. So. Whenever I remember, I'm reminding myself to enjoy these last little pleasures of autumn, to look at all the flowers and wonder when they think they'll be able to set seed, to appreciate being able to escape a sun shower beneath the last leaves of autumn without getting wet, or to feel the accomplishment of processes and cycles a year in the making coming to a close, and reminding myself to praise this last marvel of growth before the rain and cold pushes back inside.